you played the latest Archon Quest released in Genshin Impact version 3.5, then you, playing as the Traveler, would have had to select between two dialogue options in response to this statement. I'll be just as delighted to hunt down the Abyss Order tomorrow as I have always been. You can either choose, I trust you Kaya, or I think, I guess. And that says a lot about the position Kaya is in relative to the overall storyline. When we first met Kaya at the very start of the Mondstadt Archon Quest, one of his first few lines was, I understand the anguish of being separated from family. I'm not really sure why you're looking for the animal god, but everyone has their secrets, right? It may have been difficult to understand the implications of this right away, but after getting to know him more, you'd realize that this line is hinting at two very important things about Kaya. One, that his status as a foreigner greatly shapes his character arc, and second, that he's a very secretive person. That's why many players find him rather suspicious and untrustworthy. But like many other Kaya simps, I am definitely not one of those people. I mean, sure yes, he's definitely suspicious with how much he's hiding from the Traveler and the rest of Mondstadt. But I'd like to believe that his secrecy is not necessarily malicious in nature. If you clicked on this video with this kind of title, I'd reckon you're probably one of those people who chose the dialogue option, I trust you Kaya. I myself was one of those people, obviously. I trust him 99%, the 1% is just for the sake of statistical significance or something. So as I discuss my thoughts and speculations about Kaya's background in this video, do take note that my thoughts are going to be based on my steadfast trust in him. Of course, we don't know all his secrets and the story is making it really difficult for us to trust him and in real life, you shouldn't readily give your trust to someone like this. However, the lore regarding Kaya's background is clearly very important and interesting but the problem is, I wonder if some people might be too focused on the possible shock factor brought about by these revelations and not so much on the implications of these facts on Kaya's character. With my type of character analyses, my priority is less of the overarching lore and actually more of the insights we can gain from each individual character, especially the ones that I love. I would also love to analyze other characters in the future by the way, but Kaya's lore bombs just came out, so I'd like to address that first. Anyway, so the point is, I'm making this video to address the lore about Kaya, but in such a way that focuses on his attitudes and motivations rather than on Kainria or the Cataclysm or the Abyss Order. Yes, I'll have to mention those things, but they'll only be tools to aid my analysis of Kaya. So with that, I'd like to go through a summary of the lore we have on Kaya including some of the things we still don't have answers to. This video will naturally involve lots of speculation, but these are more flexible what-ifs rather than things I'm trying to prove very strongly. Also, it won't sound as quote-unquote credible as the ideas of many lore theorists who are able to break down character details, including object lore or visual elements, and that's because I'm mainly a character analyst. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's get into the analysis. The thing about Kaya's lore is that it's very much intertwined with the lore of a nation that we haven't gotten the chance to fully understand yet aside from the little lore crumbs we get annually from the Dine's Life quests or the descriptions of some enemy drops. That's why for Kaya enjoyers, any bit of lore on Kainria could potentially help us crack the code behind Kaya's origins. However, if you have already played the 3.5 Archon Quest, which you really should have if you don't want to be spoiled, then you might have felt that there were more new questions that came out of that quest compared to answers to previous questions, and some of these previous questions are still difficult to answer. And I'd say that the reason behind this is because Kaya's background is not completely reliant on knowledge of Kainria because he still has his own personal origin story that even a Kainria history expert like Dine's life wouldn't be able to answer. For example, answering the question, what is the legacy of this person's clan, doesn't explicitly answer the question, how was this person brought up? And that's precisely why we still don't know who Kaya's father was or how Kaya was even born. 
because we only receive details on the fact that an Alberish established the Abyss Order, but how that's linked to Kaya is very much unclear. Of course, this fact immediately raises the question, will Kaya side with the Abyss or Mondstadt? But it doesn't say much about how Kaya grew up before arriving in Mondstadt. For example, the Ragenvinder clan members aided both revolutions in Mondstadt, the overthrowing of the Karabian and the revolt against the aristocracy. But does that information explain Diluc's character? Maybe a little bit in terms of how he values duty and justice, but what truly explains his so-called edginess is his father's death under a very specific circumstance as well as the knight's treatment of that death. Similarly, Clother Alberich, sharing the same last name as Kaya, might not provide as much information as we think it does, and I'll get into that a bit. Dain's life really has no sense of social cues because as soon as he heard Kaya so much as mention his surname, he went on to butt into the conversation just to very bluntly almost accuse Kaya of being a descendant of the Abyss Order's founder. Notice how I use the term accuse even if it doesn't make sense because an accusation involves charging someone of wrongdoing. Now, being born into the Alberish clan isn't wrongdoing, so Dain's life was not accusing him of anything but Boy, did it sound like it. I think that adds a lot of complication to Kaya's character because his lore seems to be playing with the question of how much does your family background shape your identity and whether the sins of certain people are really carried over generationally. But the point is, look at how Dain's life worded his statement. He called Kaya descendant of the Abyss Order's founder. What's absolutely ridiculous about this is this dude doesn't seem to make any distinction between direct and indirect descendants of this founder, Clothar. And if Clothar died a few hundred years before the current timeline, the only way Kaya could be a direct descendant of Clothar is if Caribear got to have children in some way, if he got to escape from the curse, or if Clothar had legal children with one of them going on to become Kaya's father. But like, what if Kaya's dad was a descendant of Clother's cousins or something? It's still very hard to tell right now with the lack of information we have. At the end of the day, only Kaya himself knows, or he might not even know. However, like I said, Dain's life doesn't seem to care to ask because it might be the case in Kainria that they really see clans as collective units with each of its members acting similarly. They might hold the belief that your family greatly influences your identity more than it doesn't. However, some things I question about this whole lumping of Kaya together with the whole Alberish clan is Clother himself said he doesn't appreciate his family meddling in his personal life, so the idea leads me to wonder, how much are the Alberishes truly alike? What if it was Clother who was actually considered an outcast among them? This could also just be me, but I feel like the indoctrination Kaya's father taught him, which he found as an interactable item during the Hidden Strife event, doesn't sound very abyss-like. Again, I'm not sure if this is a safe assumption to make, but Kaya's father said, Remember always that it was the Alberish clan who did not have royal blood, who stepped in as regents when the strength of the one-eyed King Ermin failed. But when we met Clother, he didn't seem to be caring about fulfilling regency duties nor serving King Ermin and the Eclipse dynasty, unless the Abyss Prince or Princess is considered regent, but eh, that sounds too humble for the Abyss. Additionally, Kaya's father said, though we could not restore Kainria to life, we of the Alberish clan should lead lives as those who blaze like fire, rather than those who wallow in the embers. Again, this is just my opinion and speculation, but this doesn't exactly sound like abyss rhetoric. At the end of the Caribbean Archon Quest, it seems like Clother became a huge religious fanatic of that weird chained up purple thing he saw and the voice attached to it, and religious fanatics tend to emphasize their unwavering belief in what they worship rather than something like familial pride. So if Kaya's father was more highly influenced by Clother, he should be spouting some more batshit crazy abyss rhetoric like those abyss heralds and lectors do. Instead, what he said kinda comes across as inspirational even, 
with the message of leading your own life with a strong sense of pride and confidence in yourself. I think some people are still confused about the relationship between Kainria and the Abyss because some people might think they're the same thing, but it's been shown repeatedly that the Abyss Order was a faction within Kainria, but not synonymous with Kainria, which is why Dian's life is against them as well. I think we can even distinguish between mainstream Kainria, consisting of those who fought for its survival, and the members of the Abyss Order. So with that, it's quite difficult to say yet how the Alberish clan really was like as a whole. Were most of them mainstream Kainrians who were focused on serving the Eclipse dynasty like Dain's life, or did Clother manage to recruit them all? Did Kaya's father receive Abyss indoctrinations and did he deviate from them or just phrase them differently? Or alternatively, was he also deliberately misinforming Kaya? That could be possible too, but it seems like an odd excuse for the storyline to ignore old pieces of information. This is why I am very unsure about Kaya's relationship with the Abyss through his lineage because his father's teachings don't sound like Abyss indoctrinations and thus it's difficult to really understand what Kaya's idea of Kainria is and his idea of how he's expected to serve them. Most of his emotional burden surrounding Kainria seems to result from his father. And so in order to understand the struggles Kaya is facing, it's important to understand what kind of Kainrian Kaya's father was and how that affects his concept of Kainria. Perhaps I can make a sort of analogy to illustrate what I mean. If let's say a person grew up in a country like Mondstadt with a parent from Sumeru, that child might get a very different idea of what Sumeru is like depending on the demographic this parent was a part of. Depending on whether this parent was an academia scholar, a Sumeru city local who was not an academic, an Eremite, or an Aru village guardian, their child will only view Sumeru in a certain specific way that doesn't capture the whole picture. The child of an Eremite might think Sumeru is racist, while the child of an academic will think that the environment of Sumeru is very conducive to attaining wisdom. So in that sense, Kaya's case might be similar wherein he really only understands the circumstances of a specific faction of Kainria. I think it's been made very clear so far that Kaya is largely clueless about Kainria, which to me seems to indicate that he was either born after Kainria's fall or was at least suspended in time like Aang in Avatar The Last Airbender, but I think him being born after the fall is much more sensible and likely. This is especially because he seems to have aged normally alongside Diluc. Of course, some might say that Kaya is faking his lack of knowledge, but I feel like if he understood exactly why Kainria fell, then he might be more similar to Dain's life with his skepticism towards the gods. But the fact that he's not sure about what his father wanted him to do in Mondstadt is a sign that he's not sure what Kainria's motivations and plans are exactly. Also, his annotations behind that note in the mysterious compartment make it seem like he's confused about what his father is saying and is a bit overwhelmed by how intense his father was and sort of insinuating that he finds himself unable to think and behave like his father did. When Kaya found out about the fact that an Alberish was the one who founded the Abyss Order, he did sound very shocked at first but at the same time, he also didn't seem as distressed as you'd expect one would be as a result of such a revelation. This of course makes him seem suspicious because why wasn't he surprised? But at the same time, as I've explained in my Kaya personality analysis video, he reacts to shocking moments in a very distant manner to help him manage overwhelming emotions. It's why he couldn't mourn properly the moment Crepus died and it's why his annotations behind his dad's handwritten note feel detached with the language used being slightly cryptic. Instead of saying, I feel disturbed by that, he'll try to think about things logically, which makes him seem very very creepy. But it could also just be his go-to defense mechanism. I don't study psychology by the way, so do take this with a grain of salt, but he seems to be performing intellectualization when he experiences great distress. Of course, I do think he also knows something that neither Dian's life nor the Traveler know, like he might have a better picture of how the Alberish clan was as a whole. That's probably why he needed to spend time piecing together his current knowledge with what Dian's life provided him. 
This great knowledge that Kaya has is not something that he has revealed to us, which I'm okay with because that's his business. My point is his lack of a reaction does not necessarily mean that he's up to no good, but that he's starting to fill in his knowledge gaps regarding his ancestry and he's also compiling the intel in his head instead of confronting his possible distress and anxiety. I mean, some Kaya fans I saw on Twitter did point out that he just bolted up from his seat and left quickly upon hearing the disturbing news, which could be seen as a sign of grave discomfort, because not everyone expresses discomfort and fear in the exact same way, and Kaya's manner of expression is stranger than what we're used to. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the key to understanding Kaya's identity crisis lies with knowing who his father was, because he was the Kainuyan that Kaya was first exposed to and the one he was closest to. But by understanding who Kaya's father was, I don't think we should only be focusing on his identity in terms of his name and background, but also his personality and attitudes which strongly affected Kaya. Based on the information we acquired about Kaya's father from Kaya's character stories and the note in the mysterious compartment, I would consider this dad to be a very soulful and introspective person who is experiencing a lot of pain which Kaya did point out. Aside from that, as I mentioned, his rhetoric seems to be focused on clan pride with a hint of personal power, encouraging his son to live his life with a strong sense of conviction. Since he also mentioned some history of the Alberish clan's regency, I feel like Kaya's dad was also very dutiful and takes pride in leadership skills. He seems sort of like a traditionalist in this sense and comes across to me as rather meticulous. If I were to make an analogy, Kaya's dad as a member of the Alberish clan was acting almost like Gunhildr clan members do, guided by their strong sense of duty. To me, Kaya's father comes across as both empowering and suffocating, which is an interesting combination that is not at all unique to him. What I mean by this is that he's able to encourage his son to flourish while also burdening him with high expectations and pressure. This particular type of fatherly behavior can also be observed in Krepus Ragnvinder and Kusaila, whom I will not elaborate on to avoid major spoilers from a recent quest. The thing is, this personality of Kaya's father doesn't seem to match Piero's and Clothar's attitudes and behaviors, but again, I'm saying this in my opinion. Piero has had an organization which has been mobilizing its resources towards a very specific goal for centuries, mind you. Which means that he's so ambitious that I don't understand why he'd put all his hope in one small child. And by the way, my impression of Piero from the Scaramouche Archon Quest interlude in version of Genesis is that he's good at emotionally manipulating people into joining the Fatui because he's able to see them as tools. I feel like if Piero really were Kaya's dad, he would have had a better grip on him and not risk having him develop his own set of ideologies. He should have been able to sense Kaya's ability to become a skilled henchman even from a young age so he would have made sure to make it very difficult for him to forge his own path. And besides, Kaya seems to age at a normal rate so it would mean that Piero would have had to get with someone two decades ago just to father a child even though he'd been running a powerful organization already at that time. As for Clothar, I think the timeline doesn't make sense for him to be Kaya's father, but also as I said, I doubt that his rhetoric matches that of Kaya's father because to me he comes across as honestly a bit emotionally erratic and I think he'd emphasize Abyss teachings and hatreds for the gods more. And might mention some Loom of Fate stuff. In my opinion, he also sounds less mature compared to the voice of Kaya's father evident in that piece of paper. An interesting thing about Kaya and his father is that it seems that either the dad is terribly ineffective when it comes to indoctrination or that Kaya himself is just inherently far too strong-willed to be swayed by intensely powerful messaging. Of course, there's also the possibility that Kaya's father wanted to grant Kaya a certain level of freedom, but if that's the case, why would he teach Kaya how to write down those Alberish clan teachings? Well, it's possible that the motivations of Kaya's father are very complex in that he both has high expectations for Kaya but also wants him to become his own person. 
But anyway, the reason why I say Kaya seems to not believe in his father's teachings is because of those annotations he left on the back of that piece of paper in the mysterious compartment. There are three key lines here. First is, this was in violation of our principles. Our clan's affairs should never be recorded. This does sound kind of straightforward, but at the same time, you can tell it's sort of cryptic because it sounds like it wants to communicate more than just that. Because as I said previously, Kaya seems to like processing his emotions in a more distanced and cognitive manner. My personal interpretation of this line is that Kaya is saying that he wished his father didn't make him write those down back then, and also maybe insinuating that his father was a hypocrite for teaching him Alberish clan ideologies while also violating the clan's other principles. Aside from this, the second notable line is, For me, this sheet of paper cannot serve as any form of identification, and it will not give me passage anywhere. It's basically like Kaya saying that he finds the message on the paper unimportant, and by extension he finds his clan's ideologies to be quite irrelevant for him nowadays. Maybe he's also insinuating that Alberich clan ideologies are actually not as substantial as they may seem. Lastly, the third key line is, his handwriting was as grieving as a smoking ash pile. There is no way that I can write something like that living in Mondstadt as I am. To me, this seems like his way of saying that he finds himself to be very different from his father now. And let's say even though he loves and respects his father, he can't find a way to make himself think, feel, and act like his father. The part which says he can't write something like that living in Mondstadt can on the surface seem like he's just afraid of being caught, but I see this as him saying that living in Mondstadt has influenced his character to the point where he really won't feel the urge to express Albridge clan ideologies anymore. It's lines like these that make me and other Kaya simps ultimately trust him, because these words exhibit how strong his will is, which allows him to really think for himself despite being somewhat overwhelmed and confused. Oddly enough, this ironically makes him able to lead a life as those who blaze like fire rather than those who wallow in the embers. So I wonder if somehow his father would still take pride in Kaya in spite of his rejection of the Alberish principles. And it also makes me wonder if there could be a way for both Kaya and his father to be right about how the world works. Maybe Kaya will help avenge Kaimya one day, but perhaps not in the way his dad would have ever expected. Kaya said that he suspected that his father left him with a duty to fulfill, but now he thinks that maybe his dad simply left him in Mondstadt to give him a happier life. Honestly, I do think that Kaya's father had intended both. Perhaps the dad wanted Kaya to flourish in a good environment so that he would be better equipped to fulfill his duty to Kainlia. But now I think Kaya deliberately decided to ignore these supposed duties. Maybe I'm too much of a fan of rebellious Kaya, but part of me thinks that Kaya himself knows that the happier life interpretation is simplistic and erroneous, but he chooses to reinterpret his father's actions this way as a way of rejecting his impositions on him. So, speaking of Kainria's impositions on a certain individual, it's important to emphasize that these expectations and perhaps prejudices against Kaya are a result of his lineage. He's a descendant of Kainria, so he has to fulfill a sort of duty to them. And he's a descendant of the Alberish clan, so clearly, the very blood running through his veins is the most vile and disgustingly dirty thing in Tevat. Might as well think of his blood vessels as a network of sewage pipes, right? But what if there was some other factor that complicates his lineage? I'm gonna have to address the elephant in the room, and that is Kaya's race, indicated by his tanned skin tone. I'm gonna refrain from using the term dark-skinned because people of color understand that there are varying levels of discrimination faced by people of the same race but with different shades of their skin tone. So I'm going to stick to using the term tan now, but if you can suggest a better term, feel free to comment on it. The thing is, I do think it's kind of rude to ask the question, why is this person's skin color not white? 
Because of course, darker skinned people are allowed to exist without any sort of explanation. That's why I like the idea of Xin Yan being tan skinned even without any lore to explain her character origins. There are tan skinned people all around the world and we don't need to keep on asking them about their ethnic or racial identity all the time because that's personal. But the thing with Kaya is as I mentioned earlier, his identity struggle is very much tied to his lineage, his biological affiliations with his Kainuyan blood relatives. But if that's the case, why does he look so different from most Kainuyans who have so far only been depicted as being fair skinned? This came to me as a surprise because I went into the game being somewhat spoiled by my friend since they didn't expect me to start playing. They mentioned that Kaya is theorized to be from Kainuya, and so when I started playing the game, I expected Kainuyans to be a race of tan skinned people. But I was proven wrong. Now, some shitheads would argue that Kaya is just a tanned white guy, which makes no sense because which white person can have a natural skin tone that rivals desert folk of all people? In the character icons, he looks even slightly darker than Dia and Sino themselves. I mean, come on, this really has to be his natural skin color and if it isn't, it's time to confront certain people. In Kaya's character design, there is a harmony between his hair color, eye color, and skin color, and the way they also mix well with the color of his clothes, indicating that he seems to be designed really with the intention of being naturally tan skinned. The tan skin and dark blue hair combo is also seen in Candice, Jet, and Jebra L, sort of indicating that this could be a naturally occurring racial feature within Tevat, similar to how Vanessa was part of a race of tan skinned redheads. Also, I feel like Hoyaverse is often hesitant to create tan skinned characters because of some conscious biased beauty standards. As of now, two and a half years after the game had been created, Kaya is still the unrivaled king of melanin among the tall male characters. So I was thinking maybe there was a concrete purpose for the conceptualizers to make Kaya tan skinned. They weren't even willing to throw in any tan skinned tall male for Sumeru so far, and that's a country where you'd expect there to be more tan skinned folks. So I'm thinking there must be a reason why Kaya is tan skinned, despite coming from a nation which is seemingly mostly populated by pale skinned people with even Clother, a fellow Alberish, being depicted as white. Possible reasonable explanations for his skin color being this way are that he's either a halfy or he's a minority within Kainuya itself that existed for so long that they were considered as being on par with purebloods. Maybe one of these people married Kaya's ancestors. Of these, I lean towards believing that he's a halfy, which is probably a result of my own bias from me being half Indian myself. Okay, but before I go into discussing more of Kaya's race, it's important to consider why is this even relevant. It's because as I mentioned earlier, this complicates the whole narrative about Kaya struggling with his identity because of his lineage, because what if he has two lineages? Like let me paint a picture for you. For all you Kaya simps out there, try to imagine Kaya combing and tying his hair, then putting on his single earring before he leaves his tiny little apartment for work. When he looks at himself in the mirror, do you think he sees a reflection of Kainria or not? Cause that's the interesting thing about his skin color being very different from most Kainrians. It makes Kaya stand out in ways that are not explained by his Kainrian identity, meaning that his inherent uniqueness can't really be attributed to Kainria alone. In fact, it makes it seem like Kaya would look different in both Mondstadt and Kainria. Interestingly though, People from neither nation seem to point out his unique skin color. It makes sense for Mondstadt because they're accepting of everyone, and the knight's first Grand Master was also tan skinned. But as for Kainria, it's interesting how Dain's life proclaimed that Kaya was a descendant of the founder of the Abyss, while talking to a guy who doesn't at all look like Clother in any way, shape, or form. Heck, even his diamond eyes are kinda different, the diamond is smaller and more subtle. I do appreciate this form of race-blind treatment towards Kaya, even from such an intimidating nation. But at the same time, it makes me wonder about how Kainria views its people. 
I wonder if it's a nation that strongly imposes that a person should see themselves as Kainuyan even if they don't necessarily feel that way. Or maybe Kainuyans are not used to the idea of a Kainuyan citizen wanting to renounce their Kainuyan identity. So on one hand, I'm glad that Kainuyans see Kaya as one of their own despite him having a different skin tone, but I wonder if they're also kinda trapping him in a box. I wonder if Kaya's father did a decent job at introducing him to his other lineage if he is indeed mixed race. Or alternatively, I wonder if like I said earlier, Kaya really is part of an existing minority within Kainria, so seeing one of them proclaim themselves as Kainrian does not face Dine's life. A popular online theory that I've been leaning towards is the idea that Kaya's ethnicity is a Tivat counterpart of South Asian. The only bits of proof I've seen of this are his name's origin, being monsoon flower in some Indian language. Not sure which because there are many, by the way. But I'm not completely sure about that because I don't know the language myself. As of now, it doesn't feel that well supported. However, a striking reference to Indian culture would definitely be the peacock, which is their national bird by the way, so that's hard to miss. Of course, a peacock could just be a symbolism for his pride and extravagance, but his overall design makes him look like a bird, and his name card is also a peacock cause not all characters have name cards that reflect their constellations. The peacock imagery might hint at more than just his showy attitude. Perhaps it might be the crest of his other lineage? Maybe, maybe not. Interestingly, some commenters on their Kaya's Genshin wiki page suggested that perhaps his name is supposed to reference Kartikeya, a Hindu god of war who is often depicted alongside, uh, you guessed it, Peacock. He is also the son of the major god Shiva, which is the namesake of the Shivada Jade Gemstones, but that's only for the English translation. Then again, Kaya is far from anything war-related or godly, and Kartikeya is a polearm wielder, so I'm not sure about this little theory, but it's interesting to think about. I mean, most Sumeru names feel rather arbitrary, with many of the characters not aligning with their namesakes perfectly. Also, it's possible that he himself is not a direct counterpart to Kartikeya, but perhaps one of his ancestors is, passing on an illustrious legacy down to him. Or another perspective could also involve thinking of Kaya as a counterpart of the peacock rather than of Kartikeya himself, perhaps hinting at Kaya supporting a deity or a powerful evil eradicating figure who can better be considered as Kartikeya's counterpart. Peacocks are often associated with Hindu and Buddhist deities, and if those who wrote his character were aware of that, then it might solidify his support for the gods. Well, regardless of the whole Kartikeya link, peacocks are still very undeniably South Asian when it comes to both location and cultural significance. Then again, Kavis constellation references birds of paradise, which are endemic to Papua New Guinea, so maybe the constellations really don't reference the character's ethnicity. So yes, I caution fans from spreading this theory around too confidently because there are many gaps in this as well, although this is still 100 times more sensible than whatever theories people have about Kaya's skin color being darker than a regular Kainrian's because of abyssal corruption, like you know, I'm not even gonna rebut that anymore. It's important to note that I am also very biased here because the idea of South Asian representation in someone as beloved as Kaya is very appealing to me. Besides, another thing hinting at him being South Asian is really just his sheer beauty with his lovely long lashes because that's insanely surreal. I mean, what? <laughs> Did I say something about Kaya's beauty? Nah, you didn't hear anything. Okay, but seriously, it's hard to tell Kaiha's race from his fashion because his clothing is characterized by vests, capes, and belts, which are staples of Mondstadt attire, so it's not too productive for us to try to deduce his supposed other ethnicity from his clothes alone. Sadly, I don't actually know the comprehensive list of proof for his half-Sumerian identity, 
but I think it's likely enough considering Kainria was said to have an opening near Sumeru and also any potential ties between him and Natlan, another nation which is rumored to have tan skin characters, seems to be less sensible because of Natlan's sort of inaccessibility. Another piece of supporting evidence for this particular speculation of him being South Asian might be in the form of a visual leak, so I can't really discuss them yet. But if you know, you know. However, it's also just a speculation and I'm really open to him hailing from other ethnicities such as the Tevat counterparts of Persian, Ancient Egyptian, etc. As long as he does end up being confirmed as some type of person of color. But the thing is, of course, race doesn't automatically determine one's identity. I myself don't think that me being Indian, Chinese, and Filipino are huge factors which shaped who I am today. But the fact of being mixed race does give people like me a different perspective towards cultural identity. Mixed race people might have a phase of trying to figure out which culture they identify with the most and end up coming up with varying conclusions. I think some of us mixed race people tend to feel like our identity is something we can evaluate for ourselves and is not handed down to us as a given. Sometimes we can even critique the cultural practices of each of our ethnicities because we're exposed to the pros and cons of them as we navigate them at around the same time. So with Kaya's case, it doesn't so much matter what his other race is, but the fact that he might, I said he might, not be a pure-blooded Kainian might help subconsciously empower him to view himself as his own person, separate from his Kainian bloodline. Of course, even just the fact that he's living in Mondstadt makes him critique Kainrian culture and beliefs, but with the added layer of him possibly being mixed race, it might help him open up to viewing himself as not exactly purely Kainrian by birth. If he himself was born differently, then it might feel kinda exciting because that means he is really destined to forge his own path from the very start with neither lineage being able to fully impose on him. Part of this may not be exactly Kaya's thinking, but it might be a way for the story to signal to us the thematic concept of Kaya being really unique in more ways than we'd expect. Plus, if he is mixed race, there's a chance that his other lineage might grant him some unexpected inherited capabilities that could empower him in some way. For example, his covered right eye is often linked to Kynria, but then how come some Kynrians such as Clothar and Halfdan don't have their eyes covered? And why does Dain's life only have some kind of covering around his eye and not over it? The right sides of his and Piero's entire faces seem to even be covered, whereas this isn't the case for Kaya. This is going to be a very wild speculation, but I just... I wonder if his eye is special not because of his Kynrian lineage, but because of his other lineage instead. Maybe a Candice parallel, perhaps? Not saying that they're related closely, but they could very vaguely share some ethnic ties just because Sumeru is such a mess being the cultural hodgepodge that it is. Speaking of Kaya's eye, I think it's important to discuss what's up with his covered eye because it does seem like an important part of his lore and identity. It's always mentioned not just by us but also by himself and it's funny how he often draws attention to it only to dismiss questions regarding it. It's like he's making himself unnecessarily more suspicious and I find that kind of funny about him. Regardless of whether his special eye is a product of his Kynrian lineage or his supposed other lineage, assuming that he is a Hafi, I think this eye is not just an ordinary scarred eye. The webtoon seems to show that he already did have an eye patch even before he and Diluc had their altercation, indicating that there was probably something he needed to cover even before then. Plus, we'd wonder why Diluc specifically tried to target Kaya's eye out of all things, right? My theory regarding his covered eye is that it's not just differently colored or has certain markings around it, but I wonder if it gives him some sort of special vision. 
The main reason why I say this is because Kaya talks about his vision as in the gem in such a way that likens it to an eye and he calls an eye an apparatus for seeing. His name card also has the description, the pattern of peacock feathers resemble eyes that never shut. Can we really say that this Pavo Ocellus is missing an eye? Also, he mentioned in his notes in the mysterious compartment that his right eye wasn't actually blinded by Diluc and that he's teasing Diluc about this. All of these seem to highlight that the most important purpose of an eye is its ability to provide sight rather than its appearance. So by hiding his right eye, he might not just be hiding how weird it looks, but he might be deliberately obscuring his own vision because I wonder if his right eye grants him the ability to see strange things. Like Candice's, it might be prophetic, but I'm actually leaning towards thinking it might allow him to see things that are invisible to the naked eye, or even read minds. Or what if he sees through his right eye might also be viewed by someone else. This has probably been difficult for him to handle, which is why he could be obscuring the vision of his own eye and this might be why Diluc tried to target it, likely to blind him. Cause I don't know, why would an eye be so offensive if it was just differently colored? Again, this is just a hunch so I could totally be wrong, but it's a nice thing to think about why his eye is pointed out so often. Now, with all this said, it's fun to theorize about Kaya's background, but at the end of the day, does it really matter when it comes to his characterization? I'd argue no, in the sense that he doesn't act and think in accordance with what he was taught by his family, and being in Mondstadt, Kaya now knows that found family is much more important than biological family. Mondstadt is a city that not only values freedom, but by extension rebellion, which is probably why Kaya started to feel comfortable deviating from his clan's expectations. I feel like people are sometimes too fixated on his background and how much lore crumbs they can squeeze out of him instead of what his actual personality is like. Characterized by intelligence, talentedness, dedication, independence, leadership potential, and a strong will. His being an Alberish doesn't mean that he'll necessarily turn to the Abyss or something like that. And I think people who are too fixated on his origins are also the people who find him suspicious, which is why I wanted to discuss his background in such a way that lays out some speculations without painting Kaya in a bad light. However, I think his background still matters but in a different way. We do have a sense that he'll do the right thing because of his strong will and his overpowering conscience which guilt trips him into doing the right thing. Check out my video on that by the way, I'll link it in the description box. But we still need to know how exactly he could carry out his choice if ever. Like with Eula, she chose to disown her family and work for the organization that penalized the Lawrences and will continue to penalize them if necessary. In Kaya's case, he might have already kind of quote unquote disowned the Alberishes already, but it would be nice to know how he'll further follow up on that. Will he actively fight the Abyss in a crucial moment? Will he kill a family member? Will he help seize the throne of Kynria from someone else? Or will he simply divulge key information to the right people to help thwart the original plans of his family? To answer those questions, we must understand what kind of plans his family are up to so we can understand how Kaya might combat them. After all, it's through his origins that we'll get an insight into who his true enemy is. But regardless of that, I can trust that he can make good decisions because he's a very insightful and introspective person who can think for himself. A lot of Kaya enjoyers would say that he's already demonstrated loyalty to Mondstadt, and while I think that's partially true, I want to say instead that he's most loyal to his own ideals. It just so happens that he shares those ideals with the city of freedom, Mondstadt. This characterizes Kaya as someone who's not blindly loyal to either side, but really evaluates important situations according to his values. 
All that I've said so far only encapsulates how I personally see Kaya, but you guys might have different thoughts on him. And with that, I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below, but please state them in a civil manner so that our discussion could be more productive and produce more interesting insights. If you like this video, feel free to like this and share this to other Kaya enthusiasts so that we may all brain rot together. And while you're at it, why not subscribe to my channel so that you can catch other character analyses like this one. Thank you for listening to my ramble and I'll see you again in my next video, which would hopefully not be about Kaya anymore because I need a break from him, honestly.